Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's DC Movie News. That's Roxy. (laughs) Wonder Woman herself, yes. What's up? How are you guys doing? Uh, Fantastic. Fantabulous. Yes. How are you doing, Sir Adam? Well, um, this is um, this is a nice respite for me. As you guys know, I've actually I'm one of the few people that's I don't know, I guess lucky enough to, that I've been working more than ever um, in the restaurant that we opened, the ghost kitchen. Um, so this is a great change from that and that I've just mostly been on my feet and, and cooking, which I love. Um, but this is great to kind of talk about some more fun stuff. And what a great episode we have today. It's so good yeah. to be here. What's up? Mike Kalinowski's here. Yeah, I'm here, guys. I'm here. I'm, yeah, you know. M- Mikey, why wouldn't you put your hand in with us at first? What's going on I with you? I couldn't see it for a second. I was having some video issues. Oh. But I was fixing it. Yeah, I'm fixing it. I'm here. This is Mikey on week three of not having Twitter. So I, I think that's where what the energy is coming from. Is that making you feel more isolated, Mike? No, it just sucks. It's because I, I now realize that that is my primary... Um, interaction with fans and stuff and friends is twitter especially globally uh and it sucks it i mean I, i'm just all hoping it's on the fact that they're going through what everyone's going through people are being laid off so there's no customer support um it's what it is you know maybe when we come back i gotta kind of rethink my social media and maybe twitter's not the way to go with it uh yeah that's what we are we believe in you mike we believe in you yeah <laughs> oh come on there are worse things i know hey i know that could be a heck of a lot worse stuff in the world right now i'm not i'm not yeah twitter that's just a little thing so mike what have you basically been doing what do your days look like uh in isolation um well i'm a stay-at-home dad now with two dogs because she's okay. the only one working in this house uh so i i get up and i usually do two workouts a day i do a cardio in the morning and i do a weight later in the afternoon Mm-hmm. Uh, I sit outside, I lay in the sun and I read. Um, then I usually spend a couple hours writing my book. And then I finish the night usually watching two movies. That's my, that's what I do now, guys. That's, that's all I'm doing. Ask guys, me, ask me. I do. Roxy. Roxy. Yeah. What's your self-isolation like? Well, I've been doing a lot of great stuff, but one of my favorite things that I did look at this transition right here, was last night I actually was privileged enough to watch the first episode of the second season of Harley Quinn, and I cannot talk about uh, the episode yet as it hasn't dropped, but uh, that is what I will be doing with the rest of my time today. I have two more episodes in the queue waiting to be watched, and I am so, so amped on that show. I've got my Harley fucking Quinn shirt on, I, I didn't just swear in the middle of that word. No, that, it literally that's the says, shirt. yeah, that's what it, that's what the shirt is um, that they sent me. That Warner Brothers sent me pre Birds of Prey. Uh, I feel like as we go more and more into this quarantine, I've got some hair dye in my house. We might be seeing some pink blue stuff happening. I definitely rocked pigtails all day yesterday, so I'm living my best Harley life right now, and that seemed pretty fitting of today's show. I love seeing people's quarantine hair. Mine is looking a little styled right now, but in the morning, I look like a British mod rocker. It's like coming around here. So much fun. Nobody we don't even know what Mikey's got going on under that hat. Well, I'm just going to say this. I think by the end of this quarantine, uh, I'm going to be rocking the Chris Evans Infinity War look. Um, I think that's where my I'm going to be headed. It's headed with there, with for the sure. With beard and my hair, so it's going to get long. <laughs> I'm not going um, it. You know, Roxy, you brought up Harley Quinn, and it's funny, like, I love hearing about people's watching habits, but I noticed that, like, I want to watch really fun out there stuff. I want to watch entertaining stuff. I haven't even started Westworld. Same, this season, same. And I love the show, and I'm like, I'm okay. saving it up, but I can't get, like, the weightiness of a fictional show just, mm. I don't know, it feels trite right now for some reason, you know, and I just kind of like, and I'm usually getting home kind of late, so to get into a really heavy show is not great, but uh, I've been watching fun stuff. Obviously I watched Tiger King like everyone else. I didn't watch that. Well, then you are far I, behind. I say, I say no, I will not watch it. Shannon had, Shannon had about five minutes of it on. And I was like, get out of this house. I am not gonna 
And Roxy, let me say, also say this, because you know I don't watch reality TV, but I had to watch Blind, Blind, whatever, Blind Love. Is love is Blind, yes. That show was good for two episodes, and then it was crap for the rest. It was awful. Mm. It was awful. Mikey, stick it to the man Christmas. You have no taste right now. Uh, that show was awful. from Twitter has not dulled uh, the sharpness of his rape here. Not, that is not yes. at all, Adam. But not Adam, all. I completely agree with you, uh, where I am having a hard time watching a lot of live action, very heavy pieces during this time. Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm looking for escapism TV, as I'm calling it, where it's just like, this is not my planet. This is not my world. This is so out there and something I'm not unfamiliar with. Uh, and that's why I couldn't be more excited that this show is coming back. I know that all three of us were massive, massive fans of the Harley Quinn animated series uh, season one. And it came back. It came back uh, quicker than we knew it. Yeah, quicker well, it's than back our... today, right? It's mm -hmm. back today. April third is the uh, the premiere. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a sneakily like not just uh, one of the funniest animated shows, but just one of the funniest irreverent shows. Period. End of sentence. Right? That came out of nowhere. Yeah, I certainly wasn't expecting it. Um, but man, yeah. wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be something if we had a little bit more insight into the show, if it wasn't just the three of us? It's only. Hmm. You'd think so. That would make great, great content. But I don't know how we can make that work. Producer Ryan, is there, I mean, do you have any insight? Is there anything you could offer? Well, guys, one thing we could do is we could bring on two of the writers themselves, Patrick Halpern and, and uh, Ju sorry, Justin Halpern and Patrick Schumacher right now. What? I dream of Jeannie Wink. Everybody put it into what? existence. Hey, look at that. Hey. 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 Wow. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Patrick and Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Oh, thanks for being here, guys. Of um, have you guys been doing um, like uh, a round of shows kind of like in this format to promote season two? Uh, most of the time, people don't want to look at our faces, so this is the first on-camera one that we've gotten to participate in, most, mostly just phoners. Well, yeah, no, well, one's thank ever, you. no one's ever looked at us and been like, you know what, let's do this on video. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, come on. <laughs> Two good-looking gents right there. Uh, but for promotion for this, how has it been going? How, how has all of uh, the stops been going? Have people been pretty excited about the season two? Yeah, everybody seems really amped for it. Um, you know, obviously uh, we have a captive audience at home now. So uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? Just watch the show. You have nothing else to do. <laughs> now all of your friends who have told you guys that they just, they don't have time. They'll get to it. You're like, okay, this is a bunch of BS lying. We know where you are. Sit down, watch the show. No excuses. Yeah. Play like a champion. Well, I've already excommunicated those people from my life. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> Can I ask? Um, I can't because those people are my family. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> How did you guys um, develop the show? How did it even fall in your lap? Uh, we got. We're on a. Uh, we've been on a deal at Warner Brothers for a while, and in probably 2016, we got a call from uh, the president of Warner Brothers TV saying, hey, would you guys be interested in doing an R-rated animated Harley Quinn? And that's the only thing that they knew. Um, <laughs> and we were like, yeah, absolutely, we would be into doing that. <laughs> um, so we developed it for a really long time. And then in, uh, we had a couple other projects we were working on that we had to finish. And then in 2017, in November of 2017, we started the writer's room which gives you an insight into how long animation takes. Wow. What made you guys immediately say, hell yeah, we want to work on that? Were you big Harley fans? Were you just excited by the prospect of it being this like R-rated version of Harley? Or, or what made you guys initially decide, yes, we're definitely doing this? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of all of the above. Um, I've been a comic book geek, geek my whole life, pretty much. Uh, I, since like maybe 89 90 i mean the jim lee x-men run was such a, i know this is a dc podcast oh, no, 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 no. jim lee's great i have an x-men tattoo because of jim ah. lee and uh and uh so yeah no i uh you know following comics following harley followed jim over to dc and then of course margo was just you know in the in the zeitgeist and the suicide squad movie had had just come out, I think, at the time that they contacted us about this. And, you know, Harley was just such a huge deal as she remains. And, 
so yeah, it was kind of a it was kind of a no brainer, and uh, we had also just um, you know we were we were at the time just starting to consult on a show called Powerless uh, that we ended up um, running into the ground and uh, ground and, that uh, I really liked though, by the way. Yeah, Northern no, it was, it was a good show. We, we were, we were I, I really show. enjoyed that show. I gotta say. Yeah, yeah. So it was, you know, gone too soon, but uh, I got a little love in the New York Times the other other week. <laughs> they were running out of stuff to watch at this point. They've been home for two weeks, and they're like, "Oh, what's this? Oh, this isn't bad. Check it out." So, um, uh, yeah. So we had already kind of been uh, Im- immersed a bit in the DC world um when this came about and yeah it just kind of it just felt like a no-brainer and so the opportunity to do yeah the r-rated thing to delve into animation justin and i are both you know big animation fans as well particularly tv animation comedies um and so uh yeah it was just it was it was just a no-brainer for us and also they told us they were like it would be serialized we want to do a serialized thing and that was something that was new to us we we were you know, primarily involved in live action, very episodic television with, you know, a lot of standalone storylines. And so this was a huge opportunity to do something that we had been longing to do in that way as well. At the time, was there conversation about Margot Robbie? Because there hasn't been that much crossover in the DC TV and DC cinematic universes, although we did see it with Ezra Miller and Flashpoint, and and there have been some touch and go things. Um, Was there ever conversation about Margot coming in to voice the character? Yeah, in the the early days. But yeah, go ahead, Justin. No, no, I was going to say, I think it was more that when we were starting up our show they were also starting birds of prey and i just remember we had to sit and, and talk with margo about like what we had to like basically pitch her what we were doing because she wanted to know because they were developing birds of prey and i remember at one point it was like me and pat and a few other executives and then margo and jeff johns and uh and we pitched out what we were doing. And then Margo was like, this sounds a lot. She said to Jeff, she was like, this sounds a lot like what I'm doing. And Jeff was like, trust me, these are like not <laughs> similar whatsoever in terms of the tone. The tone is gonna be way, 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 way different. Um, and and that's, it, it was true. I mean, but we sort of operated in a vacuum where we didn't really know exactly what was happening with birds of prey and like occasionally we'd be like hey can we check out a script and they'd be like hey fuck you uh <laughs> and so we never really we never really got to read it so we didn't know what was going on um so we were just like look we're gonna do the show we want to do they'll tell us if it's gonna be too similar to that we we had probably like three or four conversations with margo um and and then we kind of just like we're off when was the first time that you actually heard the Birds of Prey story or saw the movie or read the script? In the theater. The trailer, wow. oh my God. the theater was the first time we saw it. Wow. We even tried to get like an early screening of it. I can't remember why they said no, but they definitely did. Wow. That's, that's, well, that's insane was, to me. That's insane. Well, I mean, I, we, didn't, we didn't try super hard. I mean, yeah. at that point it was like the ship has sailed, you know, what, you know, let's be surprised in the theater, but also, like they do employee screenings at Warner Brothers, but we're actually contractors. So sometimes the contractors don't get invited to the employee screenings. Uh, so yeah, we actually we actually played hooky on uh, opening weekend and saw it like that Friday afternoon at lunch uh, at, over at like the AMC in Burbank. Um, yeah, yeah. Can I ask why why were they so sure that they wanted to go for an R-rated tone out the gate? Because the character was developed on a, you know, a daytime animated show. Obviously, she's grown a lot over the years and Suicide Squad, but even that wasn't rated R. So how did they know that they wanted to make that jump? That's a good, That's a good question. question. I, they, they just presented it that way to us. And then we were like, well, I'm not going to question it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I can only assume that, you know, there, there was an edge to her in, you know, with the Suicide Squad film that was appealing, um, you know, obviously. I think Daredevil I, had just made a ton of money too. Oh, Deadpool. Deadpool. Deadpool, sorry. Deadpool just made a ton, a ton of money too, yeah. The other red guy. Um, yeah, so, so 
I think that was definitely, you know, a, a, you know, part of it that, you know, R rated, you know, uh, superhero comedies can work. Um, yeah. So, but we never, we never were like, well, I don't know. What do you think about PG-13? <laughs> so we never, we never had the opportunity to ask or even thought of it or just like, just, just go, just do it. Just do I it think, as fast as possible before they tell us no. I think also a big part of our pitch was that uh, the show would have like realistic dialogue, a kind of overlappy, like uh, bantery dialogue. And that we wanted, our whole pitch was that when villains are probably like just hanging out on their own, like you think like Joker kills people, but he doesn't say fuck. I mean, I, I feel like he probably does. <laughs> so uh, our whole pitch was like, hey, this is gonna be kind of like a behind the scenes of these people's lives. And they probably speak this way. Speaking of Joker, there were obviously some characters I'm sure you guys assumed you were able to use, but I was surprised watching season one how many characters they actually let you guys play with. Was there ever conversation about somebody you wanted to use and they could put the kibosh on it or were you guys just given free reign and the sandbox to pick whoever you guys wanted? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we were pretty much given free reign. I, you know, early days, I think bef when when we were just figuring out what the show is, it was so different than anything that, that DC and that Warner Brothers Animation had done before, or that Warner Brothers Television had done before. So, you know, it was definitely like, uh, you know, there, there were some, some pregnant pauses on notes calls and things like that. But ultimately, you know, we tested two of the episodes in animatic form and like people just ate them up like from casual fans to people who you know called themselves diehard uh dc fans and it was kind of at that point uh obvious that we, we could get away with a lot in terms of the fan base and i think at that point um you know any any sort of um i don't know reluctance to let us really uh go crazy was was sort of lifted um, you know, the biggest conversation was probably our portrayal of uh, Commissioner Gordon. I mean, he's, you know, in the comics generally has been portrayed while he's, you know, a, a suffering, uh, you know, sort of uh, hero. He's a hero nonetheless. And, you know, he is, he is sort of, uh, you know, a square jawed, um, you know, incorruptible type of, uh, of, of hero. And, and, and in, our version, we were like, well, you know, a lot of discussion early on about how Gotham City, it's, it's the most dangerous city in the world. Uh, you know, uh, what would that do psychologically to the, the commissioner of the police force when every day of his life is the David Fincher film Seven? <laughs> and so we said, well, okay, yeah. he's gonna be, he's gonna be frazzled. He's gonna be a wreck, um, but we also, loved this the comedic note of him uh loving batman and looking up to batman like yeah. um you know he is the superhero that uh, yeah. he's really, gordon's very childlike in his wonder around batman justin did you have um a, a conversation about like batman like how much batman do you use in a show that's where he's not the lead but people are going to be expecting it it seems like you struck just the right amount of it so um, and, and i have to think that that's something that Warner's thinking about all the time because we know there will be another Batman animated series and how much back do you dole out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a, I think the biggest, that was, a, aside from Gordon, that was probably the biggest discussion. What we sort of realized early on was that if you have Batman in a scene or you have Joker in a scene, they tend to be the focus of the scene. And so we wanted them, our sort of rule was like, they only exist in so much as how they affect Harley and her story. So that was kind of our our unspoken rule was like, these guys can show up, but it's not their show. We have to remember it's not their show. Um, and so I think, you know, we tried to use Batman when he felt like he was important to the story and he was gonna serve the story in a way that no other character in Gotham City could. Um, and then also I think, you know, we wanted to keep Batman, Batman, you know, like right. even though it's a crazy wacky comedy, like he is the straight man in this comedy. Um, 
And, uh, and so I think, you know, it was, a, uh, at some points we had Batman in a little more, a few points we had him in a little less. Uh, and then I think, yeah, it's good to hear you felt that way because we sort of were trying to strike the right, the right amount of Batman because he's such a larger than life character. Right. Yeah, and you don't make a clown of him. Like, like every, like it's funny, but yeah, he's still Batman. Like you said, it, Commissioner Gordon kind of is a little <laughs> bit of a clown. Yeah. Yeah, that too. was our one thing. Yeah, and we get to see a little bit more of a comedic side, I think, to Bruce Wayne in season two. You know, he's missing when the season, uh, you know, opens, and then, uh -huh. uh, you know, all of a sudden he's he's sort of, well, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil right. it for those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Bruce, Bruce is a part of season two, and uh, and we get to play into his sort of petulance when it comes to wanting to get back into the field and playing superhero in Gotham and saving the city, even though he's, he should be uh, recuperating um, from having been, uh, you know, put into a coma at right. the end of, uh, of season one. So there's a, there's a, a bit of a, a, a friendly antagonism between uh, Bruce and Alfred, uh, voiced by Tom Hollander, whose dry wit is hilarious. Speaking about uh, some other conversations you guys probably had to have with each other, and also you had mentioned the fan base earlier, uh, and keeping in mind that I asked this question as a Jewish woman who's obsessed with your first season of the show and what I've seen in the second one, uh, but fan bases can be, I, I, I saw overall, everybody loved this show, um, but I did read one article and I was wondering if you guys saw it a while ago about one person who was upset about the choices you guys made with Penguin. Did you guys see any of that? Saw that. Yeah. No, I, cause I'm Jewish. Uh, so yeah, there was, they, they felt like it was sort of, it was interesting because they, they felt like the portrayal of Penguin was like quite kind of an anti-Semitic portrayal. And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, not only am I Jewish, but half the writing staff was also right. Jewish and and we're, we, we were thinking about that episode, which is like takes place in the penguin is throwing a bar mitzvah for his nephew. And the theme is like robbing, it, it is like, you know, they're robbing the bank because that's kind of what supervillains do. And that was the way that we looked at it. And then I read the article and the article was like, this is the anti-Semitic portrayal because it's the penguin and he's trying to get his uh, son to like, covet as much money as possible and i was like oh god that is absolutely not our intention there was six jewish writers in the room it didn't ring any bells for us at the time i think right. we we're pretty sensitive about that you know um and i think that it was definitely something when i read it i was like you know what like this was this person's experience reading it like i didn't i don't want to like invalidate the way that they felt when they watched it because i feel like you know even if you're jewish you can make anti-semitic stuff you know, but I, I, you know, I, I res tried to respond to that person and say, look, like our intention was we were making like super villain jokes. It just so happened that the penguin was robbing a bank. Yeah. And I could see how those stereotypes have a lot of overlap. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think when I get things like that, uh, my feeling is always to like, think about it and and you know think about like what we were doing and was this our intention and if it wasn't our intention you know should we have been thinking about something else and, and I think you know ultimately uh you know I didn't get that same response uh that they did but I can understand where their response came from I think that's very uh very generous of you. I, I didn't quite understand their complaints as much as you did. So, uh, but I, I think that's a great way of looking at it. Was there anything else from season one to season two that you guys were like, mm, we want to try to make this adjustment or we, we liked what we did here, but maybe we'll try it this way going forward. Um, I think, you know, we just, we, we mapped out the second season, you know, in its entirety and, you know, the storyline that we came up with had some kind of extra spaces for sort of diversions from the main storyline. So there's a couple of episodes that kind of break the formula of, of the first season. Um, we do a flashback episode um, that uh, sort of reframes Harley's meeting Joker and Ivy for the first time at Arkham. Um, and, and, and actually influences the show moving forward in, in the present. 
or in the present timeline of the show. And then um, the second uh, episode that kind of diverges is, is a Batman centric episode in kind of smack in the middle of the season um, that, that just focuses on basically what Bruce has been up to um, during during all uh, you know all the new new Gotham and the post post quake Gotham and the no man's land nod and all of that so and and how he's dealing with you know there being maybe other vigilantes uh, trying to clean up the city in his stead and how does he feel about that and does he handle that with the maturity that a hero might and maybe that's not the case so you know those are those are things that we talked about you know uh, I mean, like for example like I'm a big fan of the show like Man Seeking Woman and every every season they would do one episode that is told from his sister's perspective and and uh, you know kind of breaks that formula and I, I just I like when shows do that so it, it just felt like a fun opportunity to just get creative with it. I think also we started thinking about like what are the things that were very successful in the first season that we really enjoyed like we really enjoyed Bane and we loved James Adomian's performance of Bane. And I'm so we glad like, you mentioned get him. More Bane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were like, let's get more Bane in the show. I think it was like, uh, you know, we, we just really liked that idea of this. I remember when we were first coming up with the character of, of our what our take of Bane was gonna be, Shane Glines, who designed all the characters, who also like worked under Bruce Tim, did a bunch of Justice League, like he's done, uh Vitas, like he's done a bunch of stuff he's really talented and we were talking with Shane and, and Shane came back with the the drawing of Bane and he was like I kept thinking about Bane as a guy who works out his upper body a lot but never does leg day because like, <laughs> he can't see it as much <laughs> and we were like I, I remember thinking about that and being like yes that's perfect that's exactly who this guy is and then James came on and voiced him and did such an amazing job. We just kind of built on that. And then, you know, the other thing we were really interested in is is Lake Bell and Kaylee Cuoco's versions of Harley and Ivy okay, and their yeah. relationship together. And that felt like that was that was what we wanted to make the bulk of the second season about because these two characters have such good chemistry. Like, let's explore that. That's amazing. Are, are you um, side note? Have you listened to uh, the Underculture James Adomian's podcast? at all yeah it's so good he's one of the funniest people i'm so glad you brought him up because uh i i just think he's just incredible and and lake bell as well like what a like a, a wisdom and a grounded character like a, a, in this show that is so wacky and over the top her she's just so down to earth and still funny like that was why why did you decide to make like poison ivy this character that was like gonna be like keep Harley Quinn somehow tethered to planet Earth. Yeah, I mean, I think that was that was the intention from the, from the very beginning when we pitched the show back in 2016. We always used the shorthand of Ferris Bueller uh, and Cameron Fry and Harley's Ferris and 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 Ivy is Cameron and uh, yeah, Harley's like the consummate optimist, thinks that you know she's Teflon, like she's. She's, she'll get into any sort of trouble because she thinks she's always going to squeak out. And Ivy is the voice of reason and the reluctant companion. And like, she loves Harley and Harley loves Ivy, but like, yeah, they're just, they're just, it's, it's a, you know, it's a trope that works is that, you know, this, this odd couple thing. And we were like, well, we haven't, you know, we haven't seen that too many times uh, in, in animated comedies, um, you know, and it's particularly not with these characters. So yeah, it just felt like a like a natural fit, and and Lake was one of the the first actors who came aboard um, the cast, and and once she came aboard, I think um, we were really able to lean into the sort of like Daria of it all, <laughs> uh, and and Lake just you know just brings that kind of uh, that apathy to it, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, yeah, I think what. I think I think one of the things was Lake's Lake's uh, audition was like one of the first to uh, like desexualize the character a little bit. Like a lot of people play Poison Ivy in the past as being like a seductress and very breathy and like 
and we were getting some auditions that were like that. And Lake came in with this, like, I'm so fucking over it kind of audition. <laughs> and we were like, yes, that's it. Like, this is a woman who doesn't care about, like, hates human beings. Why would she be trying to fuck them? Like, she, she, can, <laughs> she, she would be this, like, sort of over it, a little bit, like, desexualized person. Uh, or at least like inhibited. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, that really helped us kind of figure out the character. We have some questions coming in. We have a, a live chat from the fans that they want to know. Are you guys game to take a couple of these questions? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, coming from Manny Gonzalez, he says, I'd like to know how long the show will be planned for and what other surprises we will get. So obviously don't know, no, no sp- surprise spoilers but how what long you guys think in uh and what kind of things we can expect down the pipeline we we'd like to know that too manny um <laughs> we, right now we have just this second season that's that's completed uh or close to completed um and then you know we're we've pat and i have kind of like had some preliminary discussions about what a season three would look like but we don't have an order for a season three uh yet hoping that we do um and i think in terms of surprises for the second season uh you know i think all we, we put all of our eggs in this basket of like diving into what harley and ivy want you know and so that's really what we explore uh ivan in here ivan soto says can you ask them if viewers are supposed to root for harley and her friends mm. I hope so. <laughs> That's the intention. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was always our intention. So, I mean, we do in the writer's room. So yes, please, please hope for them. Yeah. I mean, we, I don't think we, we try to make it clear that Carly has her own moral code. It's not exactly in line with the law, but um, you know, if you can get behind that, which we hope you can, um, that's what's going to guide her. Uh, Larry Lee says, did you guys have to make a show Bible for the series? I guess I wouldn't call it like a show Bible. It was like a very lengthy pitch. (laughs) Um, But yeah, we, when we pitched the show initially, it was just kind of the first arc. Um, You know, we had the second arc in the back of our heads, but like it would have just been a seven hour long pitch if we had, uh, (laughs) if we had had taken the second season into account. So yeah, I mean, the early days, I guess what I would call the the show Bible or uh, a mini Bible was like, uh, you know, just just kind of the characters that you see in the crew um, and and then just like the main kind of arc. Um, A lot of the crew members uh, remain since the original pitch. Uh, we, We had like Killer Croc in the crew initially. He was replaced by Clayface because we just thought that um, you know, the take that, that Alan Tudyk voices on the show, it was just a, a much more comedic, obviously comedic sense than what we could do with Killer Croc. Um, so that was one of the changes. We had a couple like original characters that were, were in it or like kind of obscure characters from outside kind of Gotham that DC was like, um, like we had Dex star the red lantern blood vomiting cat in it which was just like well that's just insane let's make him a member of the crew and then dc was like that actually within the logic of our universe doesn't make any sense and we're like okay (laughs) we'll replace him with somebody else so um yeah but we so so we did i guess yeah the pitch was sort of our our bible fair enough um ashlyn burns says how did you guys celebrate the season two premiere uh, I made a breakfast burrito at home. <laughs> yeah, I stared out the window and wondered when the world was going to turn around. <laughs> fair, fair answers. Fair. Um, just taking a couple more. Jenna James says, what other DC characters are you interested in making a show for as well? So I don't know whether that's a spinoff or just completely separate. Wow. Um, yeah, well, I... I think Justin would agree that Bane probably gets his own series at some point <laughs> in our fantasy world um, as a spinoff. And then I, I really do think that like something like Booster Gold would just be a, an awesome uh, adult animated show. Um, if we could 
ever get that off the ground. We haven't pitched it, uh, but, but that's we something do that, like email them every couple months and ask them what the deal with Booster Gold is, and they just say no. <laughs> <laughs> I think keep trying. We'll see. Uh, Do you guys have any insight as to, um, I know you're probably going to not, but the future or the plans for DC Universe as it stands and how much new content is coming down the pike there with HBO Max and everything else happening? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we're kind of out of those conversations. They're, they're sort of the Olympian view of the whole thing. Um, you know, we've seen, as I'm sure you guys have talked about on the show, shows like um, Doom Patrol, you know, they get a season two, it's going to be on HBO Max and DC Universe. So there's some shared shows between the two. Um, honestly, we don't know. We've, we've asked that same question of the executives over at Warner Brothers. I, I don't know that, that anyone knows yet what's going to happen. But, um, you know, as far as we know, DC Universe is going to continue. Um, yeah. Do you guys have a, a hope? Would you hope that your show stays on DC Universe and also goes on HBO Max? I know that some of the shows are doing um, HBO, DC, and then CW. Yeah. Obviously, yours being R-rated is a little different, but what would you guys want to see? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, we just want as many people to be able to watch it as possible. I think that any anybody who, you know, creates a show, you just want, there to be as many possible eyeballs as possible, you know, as there can be. Um, so for us, you know, it'd be great if it also was, you know, first window at DCU and then goes to HBO Max or goes somewhere else. You know, I think that that would be um, great. And I think those things all help us in terms of getting a, a green light for more seasons as well, because they help pay for it um yeah i mean it, it, it's there's you know i always think it's funny when like sometimes we'll have friends that pitch shows and they'll be like oh i don't want this to go to amazon or i don't want this to go to wherever <laughs> and i'm like why <laughs> like don't just get it like who cares if you're lucky enough to get a tv show on the air like just fuck it wherever it can go and start from there yeah and i think like the pilot of harley uh ended up on like tbs and i think yeah, you know, we can't talk about it yet, but there, I think there's going to be some news coming down the pike uh, that that some some other places are going to be uh, showing Harley to people who may not have DC Universe. Whoa, uh, that's, 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 that's great, guys. Yeah. That's great. There are uh, people asking about other voice actors that um, have played Harley in the past, and if you guys looked at any of them um, prior to casting Kelly. Yeah, I mean, I we Kaylee was like, our, like a no brainer in terms of like actually voicing Harley for us. Mm. Um, you know, we just liked the take that she had. Um, you know, which evolved over time. You know, we went back and got to re-record a few episodes, really fine tune it. But um, you know, in terms of like Arlene Sorkin and Tara Strong, I mean, if they would have us, I think like doing uh, you know voices on the show you know, they're still working, going strong. Um, it would be amazing to have them, Kevin Conroy, you know, any anyone who was, you know, heavily featured from like BTAS would be awesome to have on the show. So yeah, if we get that opportunity to do those sorts of things, that would be, that would be great. Speaking of BTAS, you worked with Paul Dini and Bruce Tim on uh, at least season one. Is that, is that true? Well, uh, not Paul, but um, but Bruce is still over at um, at Warner Brothers Animation, and so when we were pitching the show, um, you know he was part of the discussions, um, and 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 so you know we were definitely like biting our fingernails, like hoping that he liked it, just being you know fanboys and all of that, and uh, so yeah, when when we kind of heard through the grapevine that Bruce dug the show. Uh, yeah, we were we were elated, um, but yeah, we we got to have a few discussions with him in the very early days about what we wanted to do with the show, and uh, yeah, and and he seemed on board. So, speaking of uh, people digging the show, what has because we know the fan reception has been amazing, but what has uh, the the expert uh, perception been? What how have people who work at Warner Brothers or maybe some of the uh, actors actresses what have they said about the show? 
that that response has been really great. I think when we were first <laughs> when we were first writing the pilot for it, Warner's I think was like kind of trying to wrap their head around it. I remember them being like, "What is this like?" And we were like, "I don't know. It's not really <laughs> like anything." And they're like, "It has to be like something." <laughs> and we were like. I don't know, it's kind of a mix of these, you know, it's a little bit uh, Venture Brothers, it's a little bit Rick and Morty, it's a little bit, you know, uh, Tarantino movies, it's like all these things. And, and, and so I think they were having, a, they were worried a little bit, you know, because it's hard when you don't have a perfect analog to say, oh, this is this meets this, or this is just like this show. Um, and so I think it wasn't until we tested the shows and they tested really well that's that Warner Brothers was like, okay, people are really responding to this. Um, this is good. And, I, and, and, you know, DC and Warner Brothers were so uh, supportive of the show, you know, like we've never, we've never worked at Marvel. I heard a little bit about like what was going on with Deadpool, uh, the cartoon and things like that. And, and how there are a lot of like, you know, restrictions, but I think DC in a great way will give you the rope to hang yourself you know, um, and, and I think, uh, they allowed us to do that, and they were just, like, amazing partners on the show, like, I, I honestly can't say enough good things about the way that DC and Warner Brothers supported this show, and you can see it in the show, it's like, there, so often we get comments where they're like, how the hell did Warners or DC allow you to do this? or do X or do Y. Yeah. And we were like, look, they just wanted it. I remember the first meeting we took, Jeff Johns was like, look, just make it funny. And that was like his mandate and everything flowed from that. I know that you talked to her beforehand and a few times you said, but has Margot Robbie said anything after? Did she watch any of the episodes? Do you guys know? I know we sent her uh, or they sent her, I think at least the pilot I don't know. Um, we never heard. We never heard anything back. Um, but I Jared think Jared Leto sent us a box of shit. <laughs> <laughs> but that was to show how much he liked it. Um, well, yeah, he was in character. He was in character. Yeah, he's still in character to this day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but I, I, yeah, I mean, Margot was always really kind and gracious in those meetings, um, and she seemed like supportive of of what we were doing. We never really got any feedback from her, but she's also a big, busy movie star, yeah. <laughs> so you know, I don't know that she's going to take time out of her day and be like, "Hey, I remember those two weird guys that I met for a couple hours. Uh, I'll get back to them." Um, but <laughs> but. Uh, uh, no, we never really heard anything, um, but we did hear that the head of Warner's um, features, who, you know, obviously produced Birds of Prey and all the DC movies, really liked it. So that was cool. Would you guys, uh, I'm assuming the answer is yes, but would you guys want to do live action stuff for them as well? Oh, like in the feature world? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah again i mean we we, we bug really them, we bug them do about them. call over there and be like yeah. yeah yeah at least they're taking your calls <laughs> and and only sending you poop instead of used condoms you know it could be yeah. worse <laughs> it was actually poop yeah. in a condom uh, no, uh, nice nice <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Daniel Drew in the chat says, are there any takes on upcoming characters that are different from what the audience would expect that you're excited for? Yeah, I would definitely say our take on dark side is a little, what do you say? What do you, I don't know. What do you think, Pat? Um, yeah, well, yeah, sure. He's, uh, he's used to more comedic effect. Uh, than he is Shocking. in the in the book. <laughs> um, yeah, I I mean I I think uh, uh, let's, Mr. Know, let's, Freeze. I know. I'm like sorry. I'm like thinking. I'm like oh, we're live. Um, yeah, Mr. Freeze, <laughs> Alfred Molina. Um, <laughs> Alfred Molina had a really interesting you know take and voice for him. Um, he's he's just this kind of like. Uh, almost like hammer horror, like gothic horror figure who's just a weirdo 
and who everybody like Harley just assumes that he like encased his wife, uh, you know, in a cryo chamber to yeah. like keep her as like a curiosity. And he still sort of like talks to her and treats her as in the show as if she's alive and he feeds her and he like, you know, he's like, he like, he, he uses her almost like a husband and wife, uh, a husband and wife would like do bits at the dinner table, um, you know, uh, like pre rehearsed things. And so, uh, so yeah, Mr. Freeze is one that he shows up, I want to say, in episode four of season two. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember being in the writer's room being like, Mr. Freeze should kind of be like Warner Herzog and Grizzly Man. <laughs> <laughs> Like just kind of like an, a little bit unsettling Eastern European dude. <laughs> um, I think uh, our Catwoman is pretty close to Catwoman, though. Um, but our, our Batgirl is definitely used a little bit more to comedic effect. Oh, wow. Guys, we are so excited about season two. And we, I mean, we could talk to you all afternoon, but I think we should let you go. Um, <laughs> Please, um, I, I, would, I would love to get you back on the uh, show in the future. And we have to, at some point, hear your take on the Snyder Cut, because I'm sure you have a lot to say on the subject. I know someone who's seen it. Really? See, it, ex it exists. I knew it. Well, it exists. Uh, okay, so hold on. Before I don't like, uh, I know someone who saw the cut of the movie that uh -huh. Snyder did before Joss Whedon then came in. So it wasn't like there was like a Snyder cut that like right, right. existed. I just know right. someone who, wor saw, who worked. Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, you, you saw the Snyder assembly. Yes, yeah. there you go. He yeah. saw the Snyder fair assembly. Enough, fair enough, Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We can't start rumors like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, God, you almost gave us some headlines there. <laughs> <laughs> the Snyder assembly, release the Snyder assembly is what there they should you go. be hashtagging. What did they say about it? Do you remember what they thought? Yeah, I think I remember him saying that like it was uh, a it, it was like much, it was a musical. What? No, it was no. a musical. I, he remember. I just remember him saying it was like more visceral. Whatever he meant by that, I don't know exactly. But he just kept being like, it was. It just was a more visceral film. So that sounds I don't like a word you to... use when you can't describe something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I couldn't so, get any gist of whether he thought it was better or worse than what came out. I just know that he, he had seen the Snyder assemble. Pat, very interesting that it was a musical. Uh, that's a big, that's a, you know, huge revelation for all of us. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys. We really do appreciate having you on the show. Thank, thank you, guys. You guys. Thanks, guys. It's fantastic. Thank you, guys. Congratulations on season two. I, I yeah. cannot wait to get off this and go watch the, the three of them that I have after Look watching her, that first one. You always brag. So you always good. brag like that. I am I'll bragging. See. I am bragging. Thank you to I'll, Warner I'll Brothers for sending them. I'll stay with my one episode. I'm, I'm grateful to Warner watch. Brothers for sending them to me, especially during this time. I need a little light in my life. So uh, thank you to you guys for writing such an amazing, awesome show. No, thank you guys thank for you. being so supportive. Our pleasure, All right. Guys. Well, um, uh, is there a place that we can tell people to find you guys uh, online? Oh yeah, uh, I'm on Twitter at pm schumacher with a c k e r on the end. It's a weird spelling. Uh, same thing on uh, Instagram. Pm schumacher and Justin. I am uh, at justin underscore halpern, and uh, I don't have an Instagram. So. Okay. Mm. Uh, he does, Rocky. but he doesn't use it. That's true. Roxy Stryer, where should where people go to find you? Everywhere at Roxy Stryer. And Mr. Kalinowski, oh, I know you can't be found on Twitter, but come on, people need to cheer you up a little bit, son. Where can they find you? Have them reach out to Twitter support and say, hey, get his, Insta uh, get his Twitter back. But it's at Mike Kalinowski. Uh, I'm Adam Gertler. You can find me at Adam Gertler. You could also find me at Doghouse. Uh, in Hollywood selling you food. I'm going to go back to my kitchen right now. And uh, actually, we just opened Badass Breakfast Burritos as well. So uh, I know one of you mentioned, guys, that you were made a breakfast burrito the other day. I'm selling them now. So come see us. We'll see you guys next time on DC Movie News.